I'm Paul Lubliner, and today we're talking about the original Lawson space miniature, the Gemini 12, the better looking older brother of the Jupiter 2. The miniature was constructed in 1964 by Herb Cheek's prop department over at 20th Century Fox for Irwin Allen's Lost in Space, an exciting new sci-fi TV pilot. The Robinson family would be traveling to the stars in the saucer-shaped Gemini 12. Never before had TV viewers been treated to such an amazing spacecraft. The ship's name came from the then-current NASA space program known as Gemini where astronauts, in two capsules, docked while in Earth orbit. The 12 came from producer Irwin Allen's birth date, June 12th. There's little doubt that Bill Krieber, the designer of this ship, and the famous flying sub from Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, was a true genius. The elegant lines of the Gemini 12 were not only beautiful, but practical. The shape is deceptively simple and enigmatic, and depending upon the focal length of the lens used in photography, the Gemini 12 actually appears to change shape. That has frustrated model makers for decades. People are always surprised at how big the Gemini 12 model is. The measurements are 48 inches in diameter, 14 inches high is measured without the top dome. The weight was a little over 22 pounds when built. When you have to deal with a model of this size, it gives you even more respect for the special effects crew. During production of this video, my friend Bill Hedges shared some blueprints showing a possible parachute rigging for the model, but whether on the surface or on the inside, I found no evidence that this idea got off the drawing board. Perhaps some of those crash landings could have been gentler. Fiberglass was a material used most often for miniatures of the period, with multiple layers applied for strength. However, the Gemini 12 was made from just one, a single layer of fiberglass with a few balsa wood and light plywood internal bulkheads. This was done for a very specific reason. Location filming at Red Rock Canyon required the Gemini 12 to make a crash landing. L.B. Abbott's special effects wizards included Howard Lidecker, who rigged the Gemini 12 to glide down over 100 feet of twin wires for an exciting sequence that visually is still quite convincing to this day. Howard and his brother Theodore devised this method in the 1940s for the famous serials of that era. The miniature, or three-quarter size dummy in the case of Commando Cody, would smoothly glide down the wires for the appearance of flight. It was actually gravity doing all the work. For the Lidecker method, the model is equipped with copper tubes running front to rear, situated just outboard of the windows on the underside of the belt rail. Location shooting in the rough terrain of Red Rock Canyon must have been a challenge, but the spectacular crash scenes hold up today. You can see these colored dailies on the Lost in Space 50th Anniversary Blu-ray. Our first look at the Gemini 12 occurred minutes into the Lost in Space pilot as the ship sat atop the launch tower. As the countdown commences, the fusion core begins its rotation and the Fox optical department under L.B. Abbott added a pulsing glow, no doubt inspired by the ship from the day the Earth stood still. From what we can tell, that was probably the only take or set of takes where the ship was lifted with vertical wires. Early in the pilot, the Gemini is rocked by a meteor storm. This was done by turning the ship 90 degrees and using the two belt rail tubes for suspension. You'll notice that the miniature is matted over the star background. Shadows from the aluminum foil meteors show the stars peeking through. A well-known controversy regarding this miniature is what color was it originally painted? I've heard people say it's beige or it's light blue. And I say, what brand of color TV did you have back then? as well as the vagaries of human color perception. Everybody sees color differently. With the actual and original first-hand evidence closely examined, there is no question. The ship was painted a dull aluminum. During the restoration, 
I discovered several locations revealing the original dull aluminum paint. You can see it on the top of the hull, pictured here circled with magic marker. It was very prevalent in the recess area of the fusion core, very fortunately having been untouched during the repaints for City Beneath the Sea and that 1980 auction. So, whenever you see location footage of the Jupiter II, it's really the original ship, the Gemini 12. Being painted a dull aluminum, it reflects the color that is around it. Red Rock Canyon ranges from vibrant orange to the beige of the flatlands, and the Gemini was prone to mirror those colors. On the launch pad, the dull aluminum model footage was run through an optical printer to dramatically add the pulsing glow, and that drained the miniature shading and turned the Gemini 12 almost white. Another lesson learned in special effects photography. Lost in space and its special effects footage was shot on fine grain 35 millimeter film, standard for the time. But later when the show went to syndication, viewers immediately lost half of the picture quality. The series was syndicated on 16 millimeter film as copies were made onto that format, increasing graininess and the shifting of color values. Local stations each had their own settings for color film chains, and it was up to each individual engineer to set up the equipment to industry standards. And the result was a very different color picture in every TV market. So what you saw depended on when, where you were, and what you were looking at. When Lost in Space was picked up for the fall of 1965, series art director Bob Kinoshita was tasked with turning the single-story Gemini 12 into the two-story Jupiter 2. Retaining the design of the upper hull, Kinoshita shrunk the windows and expanded the lower half. This required entirely new miniatures, but the Gemini 12 wasn't done just yet. Aside from the Gemini crash sequences spread through the series run, the model was also seen as set decoration in the second season color episode, Cave of the Wizards. Lost in Space ended its CBS run in 1968. The various Jupiter II models and the one Gemini 12 were stored in a non-temperature controlled warehouse. In late 1970, Irwin Allen began production on a TV movie and backdoor pilot called City Beneath the Sea. Many familiar props from Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea were retooled for this production. To the horror of Lost in Space fans, the Gemini 12 and Jupiter 2 models were carved up to become futuristic buildings seen in the background shots. Windows of various shapes and sizes were inflicted on our precious models. What was really sad on the Gemini 12, its single layer of fiberglass left it terribly susceptible to damage from heat. The Gemini went back to storage and was not seen for the rest of the 1970s until it appeared out of nowhere in a 1980 Hollywood prop auction. Here with more of the story is Gemini 12 owner, Andre Daunt. I'd seen an ad in the LA Times about this auction and uh, ordered a catalog, received the catalog. That's when I saw that Jupiter 2 was going to be in it. it well, that's what they were calling it. I recognized that they did some kind of a restoration to it. The interior had a light diffuser in it with a, in front of a black light UV bulb. And basically the whole finish was kind of shiny and I never really remembered it being that shiny. Initially when it came up to bid, uh, they started it at a minimum and it, it didn't reach the minimum. Nobody uh, bid the minimum price for it at the time. Well, we went back to the auction the second day and the auctioneer asked if anybody would want to see another lot repeated. My girlfriend and I at the time requested that uh, we'd like to see the Jupiter II go up again. We'd placed the initial bid, one other person bid. Uh, we bid again, and that was pretty much it. It, it was definitely, it, yeah, the range of over $1,000, yeah. Loaded it in the back of this uh, Buick Skyhawk um, at an angle, couldn't exactly close the, the rear tailgate on it. So uh, we ventured down the five southbound with this flying saucer in our, uh, the back of our car. Uh, 
I've been a sculptor and an injection mold plastic tooling designer for 40 years. I've designed and built many steel molds used to produce model train locomotives for worldwide sales. My love of Irwin Allen programs led me to becoming involved with replica model building and restoration. About 25 years ago, I restored the original four-foot wooden Seaview approval miniature that was seen in the feature film in Admiral Nelson's cabin. Also, I restored the original wood patterns for the 18-inch and 36-inch flying subs and supplied a replica eight and a half foot sea view for Kevin Burns' 1995 TV special, The Fantasy Worlds of Irwin Allen. But all this time, I had no idea as to the whereabouts or condition of the Gemini 12. Andre picks up the story. A couple of years ago, I was contacted by another modeler uh, I hadn't heard, heard from before, named yeah. Mark Myers. I was a big Lost in Space fan and followed the history of the four-foot Gemini 12 miniature as seen in the pilot episode, No Place to Hide. Doing some detective work, I contacted Andre. And after speaking to Andre on the phone, found out that the miniature was deteriorating. Now, wanting to do the restoration myself, but knowing full well that transporting it to the East Coast would completely destroy the miniature, I thought of Paul Lubliner. Paul is West Coast bound, and one of the only people I know of that could do the job. And I had a meeting with Paul. He came down to take a look at the ship and uh, kind of went from there. This is what the Gemini 12 looked like when delivered by Andre. The heat damage and Bondo filler material made it look like a melted candy bar. And the ship deserved a full restoration, not just for me, but for everyone. You know, this was going to be an attempted restoration and uh, all we could do is just you know, hope for the best, you know, that it could be salvageable. My goal was for this restoration to be done right, as this is the only four-foot Gemini 12 miniature ever made, and it's genuinely deserving of a sympathetic and careful restoration. During its 1980 restoration, the model was clear-coated over its hastily applied aluminum paint finish with a gloss urethane. This combination had turned a rather ghastly olive green over the subsequent years. Prior to my starting, you can see the outward bulging impression made on the hull surrounding each window opening cut for city beneath the sea. Only one area on the model was truly undamaged by time and heat. Here is a top hull contour template being made from that original surviving contours section. This template and another one made from an intact area on the hull's bottom, or revolved around the ship so I could check the progress of my work. I started by carefully removing the outer layer of the Bondo filler and the awful greenish paint. As the 12 city beneath the sea windows were visibly cracking and actually separating from the main hull, I very carefully pushed them out one by one. Some came out easily, while others required more than a bit of encouragement. Stripping of the old paint and filler came next. A few large areas came off easily, but the majority was literally done one square centimeter at a time. The dips and sinks in parts of the model were particularly delicate and hard to navigate as I removed pounds of Bondo. In several places, I was able to insert the thin stainless steel spatula between the single layer of fiberglass and the Bondo filler and then pop it off. This took about two weeks. I then crafted the window fillers from fiberglass cloth and polyester resin and filled in the 12 windows cut for City Beneath the Sea. This method would ensure that the windows would never again wreak havoc. Fixing the windows took another two weeks. Eventually, I was successful in finally stripping off all the paint and Bondo filler from the hull's top as well as its underside, revealing the bare fiberglass. I was now seeing what no one had seen since 1964, and I was reminded how delicate the Gemini 12 is by the translucent quality of the single layer of fiberglass. You can actually see through it. This model's survival is a miracle. The handmade wooden window frames were meticulously stripped while the burrow's computers were carefully removed for work on the interior's restoration. I'm sure many of you always wanted to look through those viewport windows from the inside. 
for the first time ever, you are seeing a view from the inside of the Gemini 12 looking out of the large viewports found only on this version of the Robinson ship. The point of view they would have seen. Notice the translucent fiberglass above the viewports. Unquestionably, the most fragile part of this prop. Once the surface was stripped, I used a heat gun to fuse the resin and fiberglass fractures, of which there were many, back into one piece. At first, it was as though I was trying to shape a wet burlap bag with no form at all. But eventually, it began to return to where it had started. Once all 12 city window openings were closed up, I was able to gently coax the hull back to its exact and original form. This painstaking work using my gloved fingers, the heat gun, and some handmade plywood contour forms. Twelve new furniture grade birch plywood bulkheads were carefully made to precisely match the undamaged section of the top hull. These were applied to the underside of the hull from the inside. They were fitted between the former city window openings for needed strength. Once I was satisfied with the shape, the insides got two new layers of fiberglass and resin. Now the ship's hull was becoming rock solid as it should be for it to last well into the future, the actual goal of any true restoration. Small amounts of filler were strategically applied and the hull was then meticulously hand finished with overall spotting and glazing putty. What this all means is that the resealed surface you are now seeing is the very same and original single layer of fiberglass you saw in the pilot episode. It is the original ship throughout. After several temporary coats of a bright aluminum paint were sprayed on, the Gemini was in good enough shape for its public debut. Attendees to the Hollywood Autograph Show in January 2015 were shocked to see the Gemini on display next to the Lost in Space cast members. It looked pretty good, but there was still work to do. Further minute refinement of the exterior hull and a final multi-coat painting with a correct dull aluminum finish were still needed. Also, the interior had to be tidied up and refinished into its original ivory color with the Burroughs computers visibly below each viewport refinished in gunmetal. Then, it was on to tackle that formidable power source, the one intended to drive the Gemini 12 to Alpha Centauri, a new and working fusion core. Its outer housing was only partially completed for the autograph show, and as yet had none of the needed to operate inner workings. This is a replacement for the original fusion core which was lost many decades ago. It is absolutely dimensionally identical with the original, as we had the recess in the bottom of the original hull, which it was fitted to, and the original studio blueprints. This differs from the original and it, in that it is made of ABS plastic. It has 64 windows, each one individually cut and made symmetrical. The fins are also ABS plastic and very durable and very, very light. So, a new structural subframe was made and mounted using sound insulating techniques. A new Swiss-made precision gearhead motor was also mounted with additional rubber to the new subframe that turns a new rotor with the same type of original bulbs and sockets as used back in 1964. Surrounding this new mechanism is a vacuum-formed Lexan inner dome. My power core reflects the way the original worked. The original was mechanical. Lights were spun around the core on a simple XY support. The only difference from the one seen in the pilot episode is that this one runs very smoothly at many differing speeds, but it does so in absolute dead silence. By a measure of luck, I was able to duplicate the slight uneven nature of the original Fusion Core's light pattern, making the restoration even more accurate to the original. The complete restoration from start to finish took almost a full year. I called Andre to come and get it. Here's what he saw.
It's never looked this good in the time I've had it, so I just look at it and it just evokes all kinds of memories. I wouldn't mind seeing it go on display somewhere where everybody can enjoy it. Uh, and it's got to be shared. It's, it's history. That's, um... Interestingly, while I was doing the restoration on the Gemini 12, I learned that in Washington, D.C., a team of experts at the Smithsonian were restoring the USS Enterprise from Star Trek. I think it's pretty good that both ships have been restored, as both are very, very important pieces of 1960s television history. Restoring the Gemini 12 was quite an adventure for me. I feel a part of the Lost in Space legacy and Toast Irwin Allen and his creative staff who brought us an entire universe with their talents and imagination. I hope you've enjoyed watching the history and rescue of an almost lost film prop that was once half-heartedly restored, but now it's back to its original and pristine appearance for many, many years to come. Many thanks to Andre Daunt for sharing his treasure with us, to Mark Myers, and to our video producer, Mike Clark. Now, it's time to find another project.